Okay, guys, so we're going to move on to bleeding shock, soft tissue injuries, and this is probably one of the most important lectures of the entire class because it's going to focus in on shock, and there's a bunch of different types of shock, and we have to be good at identifying all the different types. So we break everything down to the pump, the pipe, and the fluid. So starting with the pump, that is our heart. As we know, we got the atrium on top, ventricles beneath it, so this would be the pump of the body. So there you go, that's the picture. All right, the pipes, that's gonna be arteries and veins, including the capillaries. And in that picture, it's, it's a capillary, okay? So when we talk about the pipes, we're talking about these things. And then of course, there's the fluid, which is gonna be blood, right? So the pump, pipe, fluids, all types of shock come down to a problem with one of those three things. So shock is defined as failure of the circulatory system. Another way to say it is inadequate tissue perfusion. Okay, so it just means somehow along the way, pump pipe or fluid, for some reason, the circulatory system is not working. So the first type of shock we're gonna talk about is cardiogenic shock. So if you're looking at med term, cardio being heart genic, like generating from, so it's, it's shock because of something's wrong with the heart. Right, so pump failure can result from a heart attack. Uh, can also result from congestive heart failure, which we've already talked about uh, a few weeks ago. Okay, so pump failure, we're looking at cardiogenic shock. That's when the heart just is, is not doing the job. Um, the, the patient has enough blood, the veins and arteries are fine, it's something is wrong with the heart. Okay, now pipe failure, this is the probably the, the main kind of shock. There's a bunch of different types that fall under pipe failure. There's really only one for cardiogenic shock and one for hypovolemic shock, but uh, and hypovolemic shock it has to do with the fluid. But for pipe failure, there's actually quite a few uh, different com uh, comes from it. So this is when the, the capillaries, they expand, they get really big. So effectively you lose blood pressure because now your pipes are, are sometimes three or four times the size. Um, now there's shock induced by fainting, psychogenic shock. Uh, we are gonna call it shock because it is a temporary failure of the circulatory system but it's really, it's for those people who like stand up too fast or maybe they, they have their legs locked for a really long time. So it's technically a, a shock, but um, we, don't, we don't really consider it um, as dangerous as the other types of shock. And once again, psychogenic, psycho being mind, genic generating from. So if anything, this, this and sometimes this can happen to uh, people see uh, a really disturbing thing. If they, let's say they hate seeing blood and they see a bunch of blood and they pass out. This is an example of psychogenic shock. All right, anaphylactic shock. This is a big one. This is uh, basically an extreme allergic reaction to a foreign substance. So this is like bee stings or the thing that everyone you know has heard of. But uh, really, you can go on anaphylaxis uh, from exposure to really just about anything. If, if your body is sensitized to that substance, you can have a bad reaction to it. And the reason we care about this so much is because it is fatal. Uh, anaphylactic shock will have some of that. Uh, the big scary things is going to be uh, the the difficulty airway, so sometimes the airway can swell, the neck can swell, or just the blood pressure. Just all of a sudden, these pipes are three times as big, so now blood is not able to move around as easily. Spinal shock and neurogenic shock, they're, they're kind of the same. There is a slight difference between spinal and neurogenic shock, but at our level, um, it's fine. And even at the paramedic level, uh, it's we, we kind of consider them the same. For pre-hospital, their treatment, everything is the same. Uh, it, later on down the road, then you can kind of split hairs between spinal and neurogenic, but at our level, we're, we're good. So, but this is a spinal cord injury. So um, this is like a bad car accident, or maybe someone got stabbed in the spine, something like that. Uh, you have a disruption of the spinal cord and that uh, causes shock because our, our veins and arteries, they constrict or dilate depending on the spinal cord. However, if you sever that spinal cord, everything relaxes. So the, the stimulus that says, hey, keep keep these on arteries and veins, keep them constricted so we can have good blood flow. Well, once that once that separation of the spinal cord occurs, that, that signal of, hey, stay constricted is not getting where it needs to go. And then all of those arteries and veins and uh, capillaries and everything underneath the level of the injury, uh, they can expand and now you have shock. Uh, fluid loss, hypovolemic shock. Uh, there's another name for this. So this one's uh, common sense. This is a fluid issue. This is just a person's down fluid and the body is not going to be able to maintain uh, its good perfusion because of all the blood loss. 
So initially, and this one kind of has two phases, so the other ones um, can, but this is the, probably the most obvious one, where initially the body is going to compensate for this fluid loss. So it's just like if you were had a, a water pump system and like a sprinkler system or something, um, basically, if we're down a bunch of fluid, we're going to increase the pipe, right, to, to make up for that pressure. Our body does the same thing. So initially at fluid loss, our heart and our respirations are going to speed up to compensate for it. But eventually, our body just can't keep doing that anymore. Uh, and then the person can start to circle the drain. We call that decompensated shock. So compensated shock, the body is doing things to fix it. Decompensated shock, the body's kind of given. So the easiest thing here is, well, it's fluid loss, right? So it's going to be bleeding. Now, you can have uh, fluid loss from diarrhea and vomiting and dehydration, those things. But uh, blood loss is like the most obvious. So you could have internal bleeding, uh, bruising, swelling, rigidity, uh, very, very painful. You can also have external bleeding. Um, so the average adult has about 5.7 liters of blood, give or take, uh, and a loss of two or more can lead to shock. So there's not a ton of room, uh, not, not a lot of flexibility in the system. If we Once we go down, down uh, a liter or two, we're in. So because shock means that the blood is not getting where it needs to go, the body's going to suffer, okay? And the side effect of that is the person's going to appear confused. They're going to be pretty restless. They're going to have some anxiety. They could have cold, clammy, sweaty, pale skin. And that's because they're trying to pull a fluid away from the skin into the arteries and veins. So you're going to see some just skin changes. Uh, rapid breathing, weak pulse, we talked about that already. Increased capillary refill time. That's where on the fingernail. So if you press on the bed of your fingernail, and it turns white. Now, if you release it, it should flow back to pink under two seconds. But if you press on a fingernail and it goes white and then you release and it takes a long time to fill back up and go pink again, that's a good indicator that this person has uh, some sort of shock. A person might be nausea, might have nausea, they might vomit, uh, weakness, fainting, and they'll definitely be thirsty. So we're going to talk about treatment. Uh, for the most part, at our level, it's easy. It takes to the hospital. So pump failure, um, that's basically something's wrong with the heart, and there's really not a ton you can do in the ambulance uh, for heart failure. So the best thing is going to be supportive care. So make sure they're breathing, make sure they got oxygen, uh, do those kind of things. But uh, the issue itself of heart failure, not a lot we can do in, in ambulance. All right, anaphylactic shock. So the, the, the quick fix there, this is one of the only ones that has a quick fix which is that epinephrine, that EpiPen. You've probably seen it in the news. We talked about it before. It's a little handheld auto injector that you, you poke it in the leg, shoots in epinephrine, and the epinephrine constricts the blood vessels and helps dilate the lungs. So the epinephrine is the almost like a reversal agent for anaphylactic shock. So you got to know. That. All right, now shock caused by internal blood loss. Well, there's not a ton we can do for that. Uh, just as a reminder, so with internal bleeding, you're going to have all that pain and rigidity, bruising, distension. Uh, they could cough up blood, vomit up blood. Uh, and then, of course, you can have some rectal bleeding or vaginal bleeding in women. So uh, any, any sort of bleeding is bad. So uh, those are just some kind of different pictures of what we're talking about. There's kind of like capillary bleeding, which is the, the least amount. Then there's venous bleeding and arterial bleeding. So capillary bleeding, uh, pretty common. That's like paper cuts and, and little cuts like that. So the blood kind of oozes out. Direct, you apply some direct pressure, that, that wound is going to stop bleeding within a few minutes. Now, venous bleeding, uh, not quite as common, but um, more dangerous. It has a steadier flow. However, you can still stop venous bleeding with direct pressure, uh, hold it for a few minutes, and usually it'll stop. Now, arterial bleeding, this is the scary one, and this is the most serious type, and this is that, that there is somehow there's an opening in the artery itself, and every time that heart beats, it's just shooting blood right out of that artery. Uh, onto the ground. The reason that's so dangerous for us is blood carries oxygen. So that, that's a, and clotting factors in those things. So if a guy loses two liters of blood, let's say, and then we take him to the hospital and we put in two liters of normal saline IV fluid, well, we really haven't done that much. I mean, yeah, we, we, we filled the pipes back up and we, you know, the blood pressure might look a little bit better. But at the end of the day, what have we really done, right? We just, we put a bunch of water in there. So it's kind of like for a vehicle. If I uh, run outside to my car right now and I throw in a bunch of water in the gas tank, uh, it's going to look like it's on. It's going to say, yep, full tank, 
but it's water, not gasoline, right? So it's not really what we need. So these days we're actually getting away from IV, from massive IV fluid. Uh, back in the day, it was maintain that blood pressure. Who cares? Just just make sure we have normal blood pressure. And sometimes they were putting in two or three liters of saline into somebody. So sure, the vital sign might have looked okay, but you know you got 25% of your circulating volume is water. Well, water doesn't carry oxygen. It doesn't have clotting. It doesn't do any of that stuff. So we're kind of getting. Away. But either way, even with arterial wound, we want to put direct pressure. Um, however, if you see some obvious amputation or something, and there, it's very obvious it's an arterial bleed, I wouldn't actually mess around with uh, this direct pressure. I would go straight to a tourniquet. But that's if there's, you know, it's obviously arterial bleeding. Uh, the reason why is once you put a tourniquet on, you can't really take it off. Uh, the hospital needs to take it off. So it's, it's kind of like you commit to that, right? So all they're trying to say here is, well, we don't want you putting a tourniquet on something that doesn't need a tourniquet. So uh, apply direct pressure. Elevation actually does make a bit of a difference. You're just elevating it, so using that gravity to help you, um, and then the, the blood, uh, it tends to slow blood loss on smaller bleeds. Now, tourniquets. So this is, if it's a very obvious, turn, uh, a very obvious arterial bleed, or if it, you're not sure it could be venous bleed, you're holding a bunch of direct pressure, and it's still bleeding, still bleeding, still bleeding, then it might actually be arterial, and this is where you want to use a tourniquet. And I, I can post some videos of how to use a tourniquet. Uh, a pressure point. So this is basically, uh, there's you kind of go upstream from the damage area and you put pressure there, almost kind of like a tourniquet. However, you can do these pressure points with like your fist or with a knee or something like that. You're just putting that pressure between the artery and the bone and, and you you collapse that, that area of tissue, it closes the artery and now blood loss is gonna stop. Just for an example, so a brachial artery is a pressure point for the uh, radial artery. So if a guy cuts his wrist open and his radial artery is bleeding everywhere, well, you can put some direct pressure on the brachial artery above it, and that can actually slow the blood loss. Um, so closed wounds, we're going to talk a little bit about different types of wounds. So closed wounds, the just as it sounds, the skin remains intact, uh, but you might see some bruising, um, and all bruising is is just really bleeding under the skin. Uh, bruising, bruising and swelling may be a sign of an underlying fracture, so you do need to uh, Keep an extra careful eye out for those. All right, open wounds. Uh, makes sense, open. It is open to the environment. Now, so here's some just some terminology for different types of wounds. So an abrasion, scrape, road rash, rug burn, it's kind of when that first layer of skin has been destroyed. So there you go. Uh, it's just that first layer, but all the underlying layers are okay. So these are painful, uh, but they don't generally bleed a ton. Um, the, the biggest concern here is like infection. All right, punctured. So this is when a sharp object penetrates the skins, uh, the skin. Now, it we don't necessarily know how deep it went, so uh, we got to be careful for these. Even though it may not be bleeding that much, it could be a pretty serious injury. Um, now, if it's an impaled object and it's something that's like stuck in the arm or whatever, we actually don't want to remove that. We might remove it if it's interfering with CPR or if it's in the airway or something. But for the most part, if there's an impaled object, something that's sticking out of the skin. We actually just want to leave that where it is and stabilize it. The reason why is maybe inside the body that that uh, stick or whatever it is is actually helping stop some blood loss. And now we remove that stick and now the, the, the blood loss could get a lot worse. So generally we want to leave impaled objects inside the So there you go. All right, a laceration, most common, that's like that's a cut, right? Um, so there you go. Uh, cut, it usually goes to some of the deeper levels, maybe not to the bone, but it does cut uh, deeper levels of the skin. You can see in that picture there, to me that looks like a boat propeller. That looks like, because it's pretty uh, pretty organized between all the different cuts. All right, avulsion to amputation. So an avulsion is tearing away of body tissue, and but that means the skin might be still be hanging on there. So that's kind of like a skin flap. And we wanna make sure that we maintain that skin flap because there's a chance that skin is still getting blood flow, and so that skin can be used again. So, and it can actually be incorporated back into the wound, and a person can heal. So, if it's an avulsion, we want to maintain that that skin. Now, if it's an amputation, which means the the limb is entirely just separated, it's gone, right? So, in that environment, it's definitely going to be a tourniquet. There's no, I mean, if if the limb's gone, there's going to be a lot of blood loss. So, we have to stop that bleeding as quickly as possible. So apply a tourniquet right away. 
however, keep the amputated part. These days, with just advancements in technology, it's actually possible that a person could get their limb back, uh, depending on a few different factors. So if there's an amputation and you can find the other part of the limb that's been amputated, bring that with you. Keep it in a clean plastic bag, kept cool, not on ice necessarily, because then you could actually have to worry about frostbite in an amputated limb. So uh, just keep it cool and take it to the hospital with you. Um, so bear in mind and bruises don't need any treatment. If it's a closed wound, uh, ice and gentle compression does make a difference. Uh, elevating will help too. We want to splint all major uh, contusions and, and bleeding, especially if it's uh, bruising, uh, if it's in like the limb, because there could be a fracture there. So we just want to just want to be careful. All right. So after the turn, so with or without a tourniquet, we still want to do a dressing, right? So these dressings and bandages are good to control bleeding. They help prevent further contamination. They immobilize the injured area and they prevent movement of impaled objects. So we definitely have to dress all um, and we'll talk about a few different of these. So there's some pictures. You guys have all seen them, right? There's anything from like a Band-Aid to a two by two, so two inches by two inches or a four by four or even these bigger abdominal pads. So um, it's just a process of getting familiar with these dressings and them on the wound. Uh, bandaging, so you can use this roller gauze, the triangular bandages, you can use tape. There's a few different ways you can do it. Um, and I can send some links out of proper bandaging techniques. So just make sure that the dressing covers the entire wound uh, and you're good. It even says there, extends beyond the sides of the wound. Uh, not a bad idea. We wanna really keep this thing out of the muck, right? So we, we can have, your bandage can, over, can overlap the wound uh, quite a bit and that's okay. Uh, we do wanna make sure that we're checking circulation though because it, sometimes people, when they, they, they get really tunnel vision, they get focused on what they're doing and they end up really tightening the, the bandage and they end up tightening it too much and then you can have a tourniquet like effect. So we want to make sure that if we put a bandage on the arm or something that we're going down to the hands and we're checking pulses and we're checking cap refill and we're making sure that there still is some blood flow. However, with a tourniquet, there, there will not be blood flow, right? That's the point of a tourniquet. However, other than a tourniquet, we still do want some distal circulation. Uh, make sure you wear gloves because uh, you're definitely going to be interacting with blood. All right, so I put this on here. Um, every once in a while, it, it happens every few years, someone comes out and says, ooh, a tampon would be great uh, for blood loss, right? So there's a bullet hole, so just stick a tampon right in there, wrap it up, good to go. Um, that has just really been shown to not work. There's a few anecdotal evidence that it did work, but I think that was a, just a really a case-by-case -case basis. And generally, uh, as a rule, we don't advise using tampons to stop like gunshot. Face and scalp wounds, um, even though uh, it may be a very small wound, they can actually bleed quite a bit. Our face is very vascular, lots of blood flow up there. Uh, we do want to control that direct pressure. Most of the time, the direct pressure, uh, because the skull's right there, right, so it's pretty easy to apply some good pressure, that will stop it, unless, of course, it is arterial. For wounds inside the cheek, if you ever bit your mouth, right, just hold the gauze pad inside the mouth, you'll be fine. Uh, scalp lacerations can be associated with skull fractures. So we do want to be careful. Now, if, now we do want to apply pressure. However, if we're seeing brain tissue or bone fragments or something like that poking out, we actually don't want to apply pressure because if there's a bone fragment poking out, there's a chance we could apply some pressure and we're just gonna shove that bone fragment into the brain and we don't want that. So cover the wound loosely. You still kind of want to put a dressing on it, but, but you're not putting a ton of pressure on these, uh, on like the skull. Um, if there's any sort of head injury or neck injury, we have to be worried about that spinal cord involvement. So we want to make sure that we stabilize the neck and we put that guy in like a, a, a board, right? Spine boarding or something. Uh, so that way he's not moving around. All right. Nosebleeds. Um, it can happen from a few different uh, causes. For the most part, these things uh, are, are self-limiting. The uh, person's going to lean forward, uh, tilt you know, pinch their nose and it'll stop eventually. However, there, there can be some arterial nosebleeds, but that is a, like a surgical injection. So there you go. We want to pinch nostrils and we want to lean forward. Uh, we don't want to lean our head back because it's, we're really not meant to like drink a lot of our own blood. And if we have a pretty decent nosebleed and we're leaning our head back, all that blood is just going right into our stomach. So we don't want to do that. So lean forward, pinch the nose a few minutes. That will stop those nosebleeds. All right, eye injuries. So we want to cover the entire eye. And in fact, depending on the situation, but for most 
you know, pre-hospital civilian settings, cover both eyes because eyes move together. So if you have an injured right eye and you only blindfold the right eye, the left eye is going to be moving around and uh, reading things and interacting with things. Well, that right eye is going to be forced to do whatever the left eye does. So we want to cover both eyes uh, to reduce any sort of uh, movement. All right, and like I said uh, earlier, impaled object, we, we want to stabilize that impaled object, just like, just like you see in that picture there. I know it looks weird, but we want to stabilize it so it's not moving around anymore. Uh, neck wounds, we just want to apply uh, pressure. You can see there they put an occlusive dressing, which just means they're preventing air uh, from escaping it or, or entering it. Um, you can apply good direct pressure, just not circumferentially around the neck, right? That, that would not be good. So usually we kind of do a, a, almost like a sling where you put the bandage around the neck and then you wrap it like under the opposite arm uh, around the shoulder, something like that. Um, so, in rare cases, you may actually have to use your fingers, but for the most part, if, we, if you do some wound packing and you get a nice little little golf ball of, of uh, Curlex or the gauze built up, put that in the wound, then wrap around it, that usually does a pretty good job. All right, chest and back wounds. So, this one, um, there's a few things that, that go along with this. It's not just uh, like an injury to the chest that you may even have like fractured ribs. Uh, the bigger problem there is you have air now that's entering the chest cavity. And our, our chest cavity is really not designed to have a lot of air floating around in it, right? So if we have pocket of air in our chest cavity, we're going to notice some problems right away. The easiest thing we can do for this is we want to cover that wound with an airtight material. We call that an occlusive dressing. So this can be like a store-bought occlusive dressings. They, they make them now. Or a plastic bag. Who cares? Just something that doesn't let air in or out. Um, there's been some arguments about taping three sides or four sides. Uh, at this point, and I, and I agree with this anyways, let's just cover all four sides. So we're going to put that piece of plastic over the wound, and we're going to tape all four sides to make sure that that thing doesn't go away. It may damage the heart, right? A chest wound might damage the heart or the lungs, so just be, just be careful and keep an eye on their breathing. Now, if the patient's breathing becomes more labored after you seal the wound, you can talk about allowing air to escape and then reseal, uh, but that can be pretty complicated. And if you do it wrong, you'll end up with more air in the chest. So um, if that's something they want you to do, medical control will tell you to do that. I wouldn't do that uh, on your own. All right, impaled objects, we already talked about this. We just want to uh, stabilize and evacuate that patient. So there you go, just another picture of how you want to stabilize the impaled object. All right, uh, close abdominal wounds. So this is like, you know, a baseball bat or something. So you got some blunt trauma to all the organs. Uh, we want to elevate the patient's legs. The, the note here, though, is elevating legs helps, but for only for as long as the legs are elevated. So if I elevate the legs and the patient seems to be doing better, and then I lower the legs, well, I'm right back to where I was, and, and all, there it goes. So you can elevate the legs, just maintain that. Just make sure the legs are going to stay elevated. Uh, and also use blankets to conserve their body heat. Um, people in shock tend to get hypothermia very, very quickly. So like the number one priority for these shock patients after controlling the bleeding is going to be wrapping them up in blankets, uh, you know, warm IV bags, whatever you want to do, keep that warm. And this is just showing that if there's, uh, if the patient's vomiting blood, usually it's some internal damage and that's something we have to take to the hospital. All right, you don't need to know this. I'm not, I'm not telling you to, to memorize these, but this is just an example of if a, a person has, has some, a painful abdomen, these are all the different things it can be. And this is not at all the, the complete list. This is just some of the most common things you, you, you could see. So this is just showing you that there's quite a few options out there for abdominal pain. Um, if the intestines are protruding from an abdominal, open abdominal wound, uh, you can place them on their back with their knees bent. So we're, the reason we're doing that is if their legs are straight, it actually can put a little bit of pressure on the abdomen. So we're going to bring those knees in, and that pressure is going to be relieved, and uh, the patient's going to have a better outcome. Cover the area with a sterile dressing. Do not attempt to replace the intestines inside the abdomen. Uh, in the Army, we might have to do that, but that's because you know we're being shot at, and we may not have a medevac nearby, that kind of thing. But for civilian settings, um, just wrap it up and an evac. Uh, you can use an occlusive dressing like a plastic bag or something because our organs are meant to be wet, right? They're not supposed to be dry. So if you have, let's say some intestines come out and they sitting out for a while and they dry out, that's it. That, that piece of intestine is going to have to be removed. So 
We want to cover it with a, a sterile dressing and take the table. So there you go, occlusive dressing. See that? They taped all four sides. They're keeping those organs uh, nice and moist, and the surgeon will have to fix it from, from then on. Uh, general wounds. This does happen, um, and it is embarrassing for people. I, I understand that, but they can be pretty serious. So uh, especially for the uh, male genitalia, can can really bleed a lot, but it's the same principles. We just want to apply direct pressure, dry sterile dressing, and then evac. That's also kind of a surgeon, surgeon type thing. Um, extremity wounds, this is the easy ones. This is this is right in our, our, uh, our court here. We just put that tourniquet on if we need to, or we bandage it up, put a splint, check circulation, make sure that we didn't cut anything off, and then take the hospital. So there you go, that's a picture of dressings. All right, gunshot wounds. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about all the different types of gunshot wounds and the different paths the bullets uh, take. We wanna control any external bleeding with, with some of those dressings, direct pressure, tourniquet if we need to. Um, examine the patient thoroughly to locate all entrance and exit wounds. It is true the bullet might be bounced around inside the body, and so you might have a bullet entry wound on the top of the chest, and it'll exit the body near his hip. I've seen that before. So if someone's been shot, really do a good job checking out the, the body because you never know where that bullet's going to come out. We want to treat for shock, right? So do ABCs and, and blood loss and stuff, but the rest of it's going to be at the hospital. So we'll talk a little briefly, just a little bit about, about bullets, okay? So here are, it's a good picture for scale. We have our 22 um, long rifle on the right. So that's, you know, everyone has a 22, right? And then there's the 556 NATO. So that's what like the AR, AR-14s or, you know, whatever, AR-15s. That's all these different guns um, shoot those bullets. Um, then you have 762 by 39. That is your typical AK-47 bullet. You can see they're slightly different. Um, as far as the casing and the bullet size, the AK-47 bullet is bigger and travels slower, whereas the 5.56 bullet, smaller, travels faster. Generally, the velocity is the more dangerous thing. So um, the way I like to say it is, if you could get hit by, if you had to get hit by a car, hit by something, would you rather get hit by a golf cart going 80 miles an hour or a semi truck going three miles an hour? Well, I think I'd rather get hit by the semi-truck, right? Because even though semi-truck is a big, scary vehicle, it's only three miles an hour, right? So it's so the size isn't as important as velocity. Now, the going on down, there's the 300, 308 uh, Winchester. So that's just your typical like hunting round. Uh, and then also your 300 Win Mag, also a hunting round. That's usually for big game like elk and stuff. And then lastly, it's your uh, 50 caliber um, bullet. And you can see that thing is just huge. Um, that thing has generally military uh, capabilities. People do own 50 cals like out in you know public life, but um, they're they're very expensive. They're like 15 grand, so it's you're not going to run into 50 cal very often. All right, so this is hollow points. This is just showing the difference. So hollow points, if you if you've heard or if you knew that oh man he was shot with a hollow point, that's a little bit more dangerous because this is what we're looking at. It's as soon as that bullet impacts something, it's going to deform and and shed all of its energy. And generally, when it does that, it causes a lot more damage. So a, straight, a through and through bullet is actually going to be better than one of these guys, because uh, when these guys flower open like that, uh, it's really hard to tell where, what the damage is going to be. All right, so this is just another ballistics. This is like ballistics gel. This just shows where there's that the cavity, the cavitation from when the impact of that bullet, and then how far it goes. Now, these are just grains, which, are, which is bullet size. So it's actually the weight of the bullet. Um, there's there's 7,000 grains in a pound, so we're talking about pretty lightweight still. But you can just see the difference between um, the differences between grains and feet per second. FPS is feet per second. So we got nine mil, uh, two different types of nine mil, uh, 357 Magnum, 40. Uh, same thing, two different size bullets for the 40 caliber, and then the the one different bullet size for the 45. So uh, none of this is going to be on the test. This is just to kind of show you guys um, what the bullets do inside. All right, bites, we've already talked about this last time. Uh, it's gonna be soap and water, apply dressing, evac. Burns, okay, the, probably the last big thing we have to talk about is burns. So just know this, the superficial burns, we all, they're, they're, they're kind of changing the name. You, you'll still see both, but we're, we're kind of going towards superficial and partial thickness, full thickness, as opposed to degrees, but um, you still might see degrees out there if you're working or in books and stuff, so we're, we're gonna use both. So superficial burns, also called first degree burn, it's like a sunburn, so um, it can be pretty painful, but generally not dangerous. 
Partial thickness burns, also called second degree burns. Uh, that This is when you're gonna see a lot of blistering. Uh, it'll heal up in a few weeks, uh, but these are generally uh, more dangerous. You can have this from electrical wound or electrical uh, issues, like someone got electrocuted and they got a burn. Uh, from fire, obviously. Hell, I've even seen it from hot cheese. Somebody had microwaved um, a bunch of cheese and it was like a thousand degrees and so they spilled it on their hand and they got a second degree burn from that. So uh, it can be from a lot of things. All right, full thickness burns, also called third degree burns. That's when it goes all the layers of the skin, okay? So partial thickness is that, partial. It, it burns a fair amount of tissue, but it doesn't burn all the way in. Whereas full thickness or third degree, it burns everything. Uh, it says pain is absent because the nerve endings have been destroyed. True, that area of third degree burn will not be painful. However, if there's any area that only has second degree burns, that area will still be very painful. Uh, the big thing here is they lose a lot of fluid and they lose a lot of heat. So um, hydration and keeping them warm is very, very important here. Uh, it's so important that actually in burn floors, like at hospitals, the burn units, uh, those floors are routinely in 90 some odd degrees uh, just, to, just to help combat that issue. All right, rule of nine, this is, the, this is the big deal here. We need to know this, all right? Because on the test, I'm going to tell you, I'm gonna give you an example of, all right, you have a patient who's been burned like this, this, and this. How much is he burned? So right there, there it is. I would circle this, put it in your notes, make a flashcard, whatever you gotta do, memorize it, however you wanna do it. Um, I will 100% ask you a question. Um, so the legs, uh, the entire leg is 18%. The entire arm is 9%, the head is nine. So you can see there in the, the chest, slash abdomen area, it says 18. So you can divide that if you want. You can say nine for the chest and nine for the stomach. Same thing in the back as well. Um, now, if you're looking at that map, so let's just say a guy puts his hand all the way to the elbow in a bunch of boiling water. So he only burns half the arm. So therefore it's four and a half percent. So you can subdivide those if you need to, all right? So just, now it's a little bit different for the babies because their, their proportions are a little bit different, but for testing purposes, just focus on that adult, okay? It's gonna be, you gotta know the rule of nines, guarantee it's on the test. All right, thermal burns. So we'll real quickly talk about some of these different burns. So that's that's gonna be heat. Um, cover the area in clean cold water uh, quickly as possible if for some reason you get there and the burning process is still happening. Uh, if you guys have ever done barbecues and stuff, if you've ever seen them, people like put, Put the meat they put it in tin foil or something and they let it sit for a while it's because it continues to cook even when it's removed from the heat source our skin is the same way our tissues are the same way so we want to cover it in clean cold water and a sterile dressing do not break the blisters and uh, take to a hospital uh, idaho can treat these uh, effectively of course but we don't actually have a burn center uh, salt lake city is the nearest city with a designated burn center all right respiratory burns these ones are scary because burns equals swelling. So if we have some somehow burns in the airway, we are gonna be really worried that this person is eventually gonna suffocate. So the signs and symptoms we're looking for are, well, burns on the face, singe the nose hairs, soot, or just like blackness in the mouth and nose, difficulty breathing, pain with breathing, and then of course, loss of consciousness. So if we see any of those things, we're really worried about respiratory involvement. Um, so there you go, do CPR if you have to. The rest of the time is just, O2 and evac. All right, chemical burns. So the longer that chemical just sits there on the skin, the more damage it's doing. We want to brush away the dry chemical. That's very important because certain chemicals react negatively with water. So there might be a patient with a bunch of powder on their arm. We throw some water on it thinking that's going to help. And now we have like a mini explosion. So we don't want to mess around with dry chemicals. We want to brush those off. Then you can flush with water. Same idea as before. Apply dressing, O2, evac. Um, if it's in the eyes, we wanna flush the eyes for at least 20 minutes. Um, we're just, we have to dilute all that out of there. Electrical burns. So that is when, uh, if someone gets electrocuted like that, it's, they're actually, believe it or not, there is an entry wound and an exit wound because that electricity travels through the body. And sometimes it's hand to hand, meaning I grab something with my right hand, but I'm also touching something with my left hand and the shock, the electricity will actually travel from my right hand to my left hand. Or it'll be hand to foot. So it, let's say it's in my right hand and it exits my right foot. So you never know where the electricity is gonna go. And if it passes through the heart, you ca it can't actually stop the heart with that full dose of electricity. So electrical burns are, are worse than just the burn. Uh, there can be, sometimes there can be some uh, cardiac, like the heart might die. 
Uh, and of course, scene safety, make sure the patient's not still in contact with the power source before you start doing anything. And then ABCs, O2, evac. All right, multi-system trauma. So that just means uh, this guy's got a lot of things going on and you really just treat as you go. So stop the bleeding and then you just go down from there and you, you got to plug all the holes, you got to throw all the dressings on there, do whatever you can do uh, to treat those injuries. All right, so um, you don't so much need to, I mean, if you want to remember CO is cardiac output, output and SVR is systemic vascular resistance. So resistance means like the difficulty, right? So uh, this is like the, the main shocks. There's a few others, but these are like the main five we talked about. Hypovolemic is going to have low blood pressure, fast heart rate, uh, decreased cardiac output, and it's going to have more resistance um, going through the system. Cardiogenic is going to have hypotension and uh, fast heart rate. And uh, so it's almost similar to hypovolemic. The difference being cardiogenic, it's related to the heart. Hypovolemic, it's related to fluid. Neurogenic, hypotension, slow heart rate, warm, dry skin. Uh, anaphylactic hypotension tachycardia and that'll you know like as a reminder that'll be some sort of allergic reaction and then septic is that's a that's a whole body infection so that's just a type of that's a infection that kind of takes over the whole body and you have the exact same problem uh, we didn't talk about it a ton but it's fine just one just wanted to put it out there uh, may not be in the test but it's just the type of, sh of shock that results from a massive systemic infection so I will put all this on the, uh, the little uh, message board there. I will put these highlights on there just so we're clear. Um, and expect a test within probably, I say two or three weeks. So, uh, but I'll put out a study guide and everything like that. So uh, just keep reviewing these PowerPoints and let me know if you have any questions.